Hi everybody, welcome to week two. I hope class is going well for you. I know uh, figuring out Canvas is a little confusing. I know I've had a few problems too, so I hope that's going smoothly for you. I wanna remind you first about a couple of things and then give you an overview for this coming week's uh, reading. So first of all, you have a paper that's gonna be due later in class, but uh, the week after next on June 29th, you have an outline due for this paper. So you do need to pick your topic relatively soon. And I know you haven't read a ton of information yet, but I think if you flip through the table of contents, that will give you a good idea of topics. Also looking at the index in the back of the book would be helpful. Um, as far as the paper goes, you will turn in an outline. That's the first step in the paper. In this outline, I just want it to be a keyword outline. I don't need sentences or phrases. You don't have to write out your thesis statement, but it should be broken up intro, body, conclusion, and you should outline the whole paper. And remember, anytime there's an A, there is a B. Anytime there's a Roman numeral one, there's a Roman numeral two, so on and so forth. So make sure that you are following um, a good format for that. I'm most familiar with MLA, so if you just simply Googled MLA format template, that would, or MLA, sorry, MLA outline template, I'm sure you could find something that would help, help you do this easily. Um, when you do write the paper, just so you know, I do want you to have four outside sources. Uh, you can use the textbook as one of those sources, but you need at least three other outside mm -hmm. sources. Um, I want the paper to start with an intro and have a body and a conclusion. And just so you know, in my idea, an intro kind of looks like this, where it starts off kind of broad up here and then it narrows down to the topic. And the last sentence of the intro usually includes some sort of internal like summary of what's going to happen or what you're going to talk about. Um, the first sentence of your paper should never tell me your topic, but by the end of the first paragraph, I should know your topic. Obviously, the body of the paper is where you're making your case. You're making an argument that this is the most important person or event in the history of the church, right? And so um, the body of the paper are the main points of that argument. This person is important because of A, B, C, D. And of course, you're going to back that up with research. And then in your conclusion, you're basically summarizing what you said. It is not a repeat of the introduction. It should not be word for word what the intro says. And you never should introduce any new information in the conclusion, okay? Also, um, don't use any personal pronouns, please, within the paper. This is a formal paper. Uh, I also am, would like you to use MLA, APA, or Chicago Turabian. To be honest with you, I'm most familiar with MLA, but I will accept all three of those styles mm -hmm. of writing. As you start the reading for this week, you're going to first read about the New Testament and Jesus. Okay, so of course Jesus is uh, very important to the history of Christianity. And when you talk about the New Testament, there are four main sections of the New Testament. The Gospels, Acts of the Apostles, Letters, and the Book of Revelation. And we find out the most important information about Jesus from the Gospels. The word gospel means the good news. And when Mark, who wrote the first gospel, sat down to write this gospel... He, uh, he started a whole new genre. And anyway, in uh, the genre of a gospel, you're going to read about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke's gospels are known as the synoptic gospels. We believe Matt, or Mark's gospel was written first, and that Matthew and Luke used Mark as a source, and that they had some other source that we refer to as the Q source. And that um, those three were written first, with John's written last. John's gospel is about 90% different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It makes sense if there were already three accounts that basically told the same story. A reason to do a fourth one would be just to include new information. Also, John's gospel is quite different in its writing style and its Christology, and you're going to read about kind of highlights of each of those gospels this week. After the time of Jesus, uh, then the followers started missionary work with Peter and Paul as the primary people. And Peter and Paul did amazing work. Paul in particular traveled all over the ends of the earth or the Mediterranean Sea to spread the word about Jesus. Paul had a real conversion experience. He was very anti-Christian early in his life. He's what you call a Pharisee when he was 
uh, raised and taught. And that means he was a very strict follower of the law. And after he had this conversion experience where he was knocked off a horse and blinded by this bright light and asked, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? After that, he really totally became a different person and went on to preach to so many people about Jesus. And in particular, um, saw himself as the apostle to the Gentiles and was really uh, helpful in Gentile conversion. So after those years of missionary work and the church fathers started to develop. Now, these would have been people who were uh, associated with the apostles and would have heard the stories from them. And that was true at the beginning. Uh, the patristic era, I think, goes till about 750 AD. And anyway, um, they start to do their own writing. They start to look at the earliest writings about Jesus and judge them and decide what they thought should be included in the canon of the New Testament. Marcion was the first person who came up with a list of what should be included, and then many other people started to make their own lists. So it wasn't until the late 300s, early 400s, that they actually settled on what books should be included in the New Testament. When they did that, they were trying to pick books that had a connection with the apostles, that had some sound teaching in them, that were read a lot by churches um, in the you know, early Christian church, and that didn't have any connection to any heresies. A heresy is a lie against the church, and any heretical group, when they wrote about Jesus, they definitely tried to disclude their writing as well. Uh, when you read in the New Testament, when they finally formulated what that should be, some of the most important things are the infancy narratives of the stories of Jesus' birth and childhood, also the st stories of his important teachings, his miracles, his parables, which of course parables are a specific type of teaching. They usually um, incorporated some kind of fictional story that utilized um, people working jobs or participating in things that were part of their culture. And then um, had some sort of twist at the end that surprised them, really caught their attention. Also, we read the passion narratives in the gospel, which retell the um, death and resurrection stories of Jesus. And each gospel is a little bit different in their passion narratives. Um, in the early church, some of the big arguments were about Gentile conversion. Uh, primarily, as Gentiles wanted to convert, did they have to be Jewish first? The first Christians were all Jew Jewish. Um, they were just seen as kind of a sect of Judaism. And so now they had to decide with these people who were not Jewish at all, do they have to be circumcised, follow Jewish law, or can they just be Christian? And there was an important church council that met, and they decided that they didn't have to be Jewish first. And this was the beginning of the end of the kind of connection between Judaism and Christianity. Another big issue or question was about how are we saved? And we talk, talk about this as justification. How are we put back into a right relationship with God and therefore get to share in eternity? And there's a lot of different arguments about that, but basically they center around justification by faith or justification by works. Justification by works would be following uh, protocol or prescribed actions, behaviors, and that gets you into heaven. Or um, faith would just be simply having a faith in Jesus, believing in Jesus. And St. Paul, in particular, believed that we were saved by our faith alone. But you have to remember, again, that he was a Pharisee, and they were strict followers of the law, so they went by the letter of the law. And so he was really reacting to what he had seen as people going through these, what I would call empty works, instead of, you know, important works. And um, James, the Apostle James, argued back against St. Paul, who said, it's faith and works together, that if you really do have faith, that will show in your actions. And as Catholics, we really agree with St. James. Uh, but that was another issue. This justification question comes up again when you read about St. Augustine and the Pelagians and also when we get to the Protestant Reformation. Um, of course, they argued about the nature of Jesus as well. Like, was Jesus human? Was he divine? Was he both? Was he neither? Was he halfway human, halfway divine? Um, some spirit who just looked human? And this is what they really debated in the early church. And as they debated it, they met to discuss these issues, and these became the early church councils. And every time they discussed it, they really solidified their beliefs about this. And then they would 
uh, classified people who disagreed with their beliefs as heretics. Again, a heresy is a lie against the church. And really, the heretics get a lot of negative press as you read about them, and I'm not saying it was a good thing in general, but it really is important to recognize that if they hadn't brought up their opinions or hadn't asked this important question, it would have never forced us to really solidify what we think is true about the nature of Jesus. Another thing that's important in the history you'll read next week or in the second week of class is about monasticism. The monastery starts to develop. First, we see people leaving society and going off on their own and then kind of banding together as hermits in these little like areas. And then eventually they put walls around those hermitage and then called them a monastery. The monastics uh, really tried to stay away from society and spend their time praying and studying. Uh, and there's good and bad to that. Eventually they became some of the largest landowners, which gave them a lot of power. And in the sense of the feudal system that was also present at the time, they really were kind of higher up and they didn't necessarily uh, spend their time with the lowly like Jesus probably would have. Finally, you're going to read about a really important person named St. Augustine. St. Augustine is impor important because of the great writings that he left the church on the city of God and his confessions among the most important too. But his story is also really helpful because he kind of is someone we can all relate to. St. Augustine really rejected Christianity early on. He was a pretty wild child. Um, he did a lot of drinking, partying, sleeping around. He had a concubine who he had a child with, but they were never married. Meanwhile, his mother's begging him to become Christian, and he really rejected that for a long time. He joined some other heretical groups. But eventually, um, as the legend goes, he was one day sitting in a park. He heard some children chanting, take and read, take and read. And he took this to mean that he should read the Bible. So he started to read the Bible, and in particular, Paul's letters. He also committed himself to going to church for one year and kind of give the Bible and church a chance. And the church he went to, um, the priest there was St. Ambrose, and St. Ambrose was an excellent speaker. And so we really credit three, th three things with Augustine's eventual conversion. That would be his mother's prayers and Ambrose's homilies and also the Bible. Again, he went on to be one of the greatest of all Catholic theologians, and his writings today still influence the church. So I hope you enjoyed the reading this week. And uh, again, there will be a quiz at the end of the week, 30 questions. You'll have 45 minutes again. And feel free to work ahead a little. I'm trying to work ahead on writing the tests and quizzes to get that um, available for you if you do want to work ahead. As always, if you have any questions, let me know. Have a great week.